So to share the story about my boss is I actually got pulled into a meeting with senior executives on a project where I knew the information, but I was just low on the totem pole. So I sat there very quietly through the meeting and when we left, he pulled me aside and he said, Amy, if you ever do that to me again, we're going to have bigger words than we're having right now. He was upset because I stayed silent in that meeting. That was... welcome hello how are you very good how are you good i'm so excited that you've said yes to be on the break time with patty show <laughs> you had my mercy <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding i was gonna have a, good, a very good time without delay let me introduce amy campbell to you dear friend number one Amy is a senior human resources advisor in violence and harassment with the government of Canada. And she's also, number two, the District 61 director at Toastmasters International. If you do not know this, Toastmasters is a nonprofit educational organization that teaches public speaking and leadership skills through a wo worldwide network of clubs. We have uh, about 280,000 members right now in more than 14,700 clubs in 144 countries. <laughs> Number three, Amy is a master communicator. <laughs> she has been a Toastmasters member since 2013. And since joining, she has been applying the lessons learned in Toastmasters to her professional career and in all areas of her life. Number four, finally, she is a woman on a mission to give back to the world through all her adventures and all her fundraisers to raise money for charities that are dear to her heart. I've talked enough. <laughs> Let's get started. Amy, <laughs> can you tell us about young Amy and what it was like to be in her shoes growing up, please? Where did it all begin? <laughs> oh, well, if I'm being sarcastic, it all began on a cold night in October. <laughs> so, I, I grew up in a small town and with small town living comes small town gossip and all of that stuff. Uh, and it's interesting because where I am today is definitely not the same individual I was back as a child or as a teenager and vastly different. So people have a hard time when I say that I was the youth who who just could not bring herself to put herself out there. Uh, I would do everything I could to blend into the crowd, lie low just enough under the radar to never be noticed, uh, but high enough that I wasn't picked on drastically. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting that I often didn't use my voice, often couldn't find my voice, and was happy just sitting at the back of the room. Mm -hmm. um, I think inevitably there was a part of me that just wasn't happy with that, but felt that that's where I was supposed to be or what I was supposed to do in life. And it took until university, I would say, when I left my small town and decided to venture out and, and begin, you know, life post-teenagerhood. Uh, it, was, it was the opportunity to really figure out who I am and what my personality really, truly was. Because I remember having a very active response inside my head to a lot of things. <laughs> but I wanted the opportunity to actually be me and feel comfortable with, with who I was. So young Amy was definitely a very, very quiet, quiet individual. <laughs> oh, that is so relatable for, to me. Because me too, I just wanted to blend in. It felt safer to not be seen, if I may. Okay. But often I was in situations where I, I said, I wish I would have said this. I wish I would have done that. My entire life, I never spoke. So definitely young Amy and young Patty have a lot in common there. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head, the word it's safe, it was safe. And, and while that might be comfortable, there's an, um, there's an element of uncomfortableness that comes with that, that you're not truly who you are. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So now you made it to university, and you have a bachelor's of commerce and another one in psychology. What made you choose those fields of study, by the way? The Bachelor of Commerce was chosen. The Bachelor of Art Psychology chose me. So 
I've always believed everyone has a story. Everyone has gotten to where they've gotten to for specific reasons or purposes in life. Uh, mine came in a very roundabout medical story. So I was determined leaving high school that I was going to be world's best accountant. That was what I was so desired in life was world's best accountant. Yeah. Oddly enough, my finance courses were the ones, the last ones I ever wanted to do my homework for my assignments for. And while I did completely fine in university, I just had no passion for it, but I was driven on this career. So we were going to go through the commerce degree. In my third year of university, I was actually taken into the hospital by ambulance. And while everybody was pegging migraines because my mother suffers from migraines, so it seemed like a natural progression that I was going to inherit these. The reality is I owe my life to a paramedic when they shone a flashlight in my eye and he said, does this bother you? And my immediate response was quite sarcastic. And I looked at him, and I said, if I shine a flashlight in your eyes, is it going to bother you? And that's when they realized that if this was truly a migraine, I would have been on the floor in pain, absolutely miserable, but I was not. And so then I got taken in all kinds of testing and they actually found a brain tumor. Mm. Because of all of that, and because I was insistent after the surgery, so they put me on medication for a week so they could reduce the swelling in my brain to get in, operate, and remove it. By the way, 100% success rate on that. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, by the time it was removed, a week had, two weeks had passed. Uh, the third year had already begun. I was told no work, no school, no nothing for one year. And me being, you know, the infinitely wise, know-it-all 20-year-old that I was at the time, looked at my neurosurgeon. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I went back to school a week after all of that. <laughs> now, there comes a downfall of being determined and just wanting to keep up with my peers because that was inside my head was I didn't want to have to be with a group of individuals below me and remake friends in the middle of my university career. So I wanted to stay with my peers. And because of that, there was one accounting class that I just could not make it through. I was still sleeping 14 to 18 hours a day. I had class Wednesday nights and that accounting class was first thing Thursday morning. And I had peers doing everything they could to get me through those assignments, get me through the questions, get me like help me understand what was going on. But I just didn't have the mental capacity to make it through. I openly admit that was the only university course I failed. Uh, and my other two classes I took that semester to keep me in full-term status. Well, I did not fail them. They were not pulling in stellar grades just because of the, the situation. And I say that with pride. Everybody has a story. This is my story. <laughs> and so with that, my GPA took a little bit of a, a dive. And so there was a sudden realization that what do I want to do? I didn't want a commerce degree with no concentration. Every courses we were looking at a combination, they were effectively going to make me do, you know, a whole bunch of extra additional courses just to get the GPA back up. Um, but by the time, so when all of this came in discovery, we realized I was two and a half credits away from a whole second degree. So I just did the two and a half credits, <laughs> a whole extra term. One extra term got me a whole second degree for what I like to say, no reason other than giggles, because I could. <laughs> so yeah. there, there's a lot of, you know, we've, we've joked in my, in my career that uh, with colleagues that, you know, oh, I did a university degree for spite, because that was the only thing I could do without having to redo all kinds of courses. Uh, it's been an ongoing joke. It's still an <laughs> ongoing joke. One that, like I say, most people would probably have that moment of shame. Nope, I will say it. Did brain surgery in a week, went back to school and was just a little too pig headed for my own good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes. Well, you made it. I'm happy you made it. And you have a good story for me. Did you ever write a speech about this? <laughs> Oddly enough, I have not. It's yeah. it's very interesting about the tumor because it's a part of my life, but it's not something, and it's part that I'm very comfortable speaking about and speaking to, but it's not something I've ever been comfortable doing a speech on and finding that balance of bringing people into that world, but having the appropriate amount of levity towards the subject. Mm -hmm. Because 
A speech is one way. So it's one way communication out. And I find sometimes those subjects very difficult to hear the way they're presented because the audience is not responsible for my tumor. They're not meant to made to feel guilty. And so when you can't have a conversation to make sure the other person is okay when you hear this information, it becomes a very heavy topic. Mm -hmm. There's also an assumption that the brain tumor is the most serious ailment that's ever happened in that room. And often you have somebody who's either going through cancer treatments at the moment, uh, has lost a child and has buried a child and that causes unbelievable grief. So it goes back to my, my feelings of everyone has a story and everyone's story is different and everyone's response is different. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, those kinds of stories are conversations. Mm -hmm. And until I can figure out the proper way to share it in a one way dial a one-way monologue mm -hmm. uh, I'm happy keeping it just to conversation yes. so that we can all have a good laugh about there it there you go yeah well here you go you shared it now so um, thank you so much for it's out me. there <laughs> yes <laughs> it's a safe place here Amy it's a safe place <laughs> so wonderful so I'd like to know what was the turning point because I'm assuming you're in the workforce at this point you have your two bachelor's degree so what was the turning point that made you decide to go visit a Toastmasters club for the first time? Mm. The first time, so there's actually a, I would say a three time start to this whole event as to how Amy got into Toastmasters. So the first time was a former colleague. Um, I used to work at a charity and then I went into a consulting firm. So a colleague from the charity had sent me a, an agenda for a Toastmasters club. And to this day, I still remember the club's name and the agenda and what it looked like. I remember the blue, I remember the logo. And she said, Amy, I'm gonna go. Would you want to join me? I said, yes, that would be awesome. I think that would be great. Having no idea, I just generally say yes to a lot of things that sound really fun. <laughs> so, so we had arranged, but then she'd canceled and I never went on my own because um, it was a lunch hour club and I always felt through lunch, it was very hard to leave as a consultant. You're the one there doing all of the, the, the deadlines and, and whatnot. So, so it never happened. Then I found, I went back, it randomly came into my brain months down the road and I went to the internet as we do nowadays and <laughs> put it in and I found one that was reasonably close and I live my life by what is on the bus schedule near me <laughs> what is the timing and how can I get there in the middle of winter in the least amount of bus time mm -hmm. so I found a club that was by by my home the unfortunate part is I had confused the church it was being held in I had a visual in my brain and what was in my brain was not the actual church that it was at and I couldn't find the side street that the church was was in because I wasn't quite familiar with the back streets of that area. By the time I got there, I had walked up the steps and, and I was just about to sort of peek into the door where the club was meeting. And I heard this voice of, remember you want to be on time. We don't appreciate it when you're late. And I sat down <laughs> and I went, do I go in? Don't I go in? Do I go in? Don't I go in? They're not gonna like it if I go in. I don't know what to do. And I sat on the stairs outside of that room because they were just at the top. And I, for probably, I, I, I would not be shocked if it was 10 minutes and I don't think I'm being dramatic because it was a debate on do I go in or do I not go in? And I chickened out and I left. So I went back home and didn't think much of it for a period of two years. Once again, a colleague, a different colleague this time, I was whining about a course I was in about adult or adult education and evaluations and I just was whining about an assignment to a colleague and she said Amy I'm doing an education tonight on evaluation so why don't you come with me and we'll go out to that club so I went to the club visited with her lovely venue I remember the cookies at break I remember a few of the people I remember the the, the lectern there I remember the banner there's a lot of memories from that night and I remember the grammarian telling me that I had 63 legs or arms. And I'm thinking in my head, I know that I am not perfect. I'm well aware I'm not perfect. But I also know that I have never entered like into my vocabulary to that extent. He had mixed up the two guests, but it was enough to shame me to not really want to go back. And so I said to my colleague who brought me, you know, I, I said, I, I don't really get it. I just don't completely understand it. And she looks at me and goes, Amy, <laughs> I got a club for you. So I'm like, 
okay, this better be good here. So she took me to another club. So this being the third club, and I could not tell you exactly why or what it was about this club, because if you go to my requirements on the busing line, it was not on the busing line. It was cold in the middle of winter coming home from that club, but it was worth it. But I remember that first that first night walking in with her and seeing the club, the members that I knew, not spoken to anyone. And it was just like, oh, my people, I'm with my people. <laughs> It was, it was just hilarious because it was all genders, all ages, all race, like just a massive mixed group. And I think that's what I loved most about it because I felt like I fit in with a bunch of misfits. Mm -hmm. And in that first sort of intro, the, the Toastmaster, I got to see a few of them banter and it was just my style of humor, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of dryness, a little bit of sarcasm, a little bit of poke and fun. And it just... The, the third if I thought I felt at home the first 30 seconds halfway through the meeting I'm like you guys are stuck with me because I want to come back <laughs> mm. want to come back and so I did they they were very 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 kind because I didn't get it now that I'm in district leadership I get it but mm. they allowed me to hang out for six months because then my courses were done so I felt I could afford the membership mm. and join them so wow. that's that's the story of how I got into Toastmasters and you know the three different attempts that it took uh, but I I don't I don't regret any of it at all I think I needed to go through that fearful moment yes. um, and then keep coming back to realize when you hear something like that it was not against me it was not and it was a genuine sentiment from that Toastmaster about being on time uh, and it's it's getting over that fact that everybody has a different way of delivering a message and so well, I've never directly gone back to that moment. I think Toastmasters has ultimately given me the courage to look back at that moment and say, mm -hmm. yeah, it was okay, Amy. You don't have to, you don't have, to have the anxiety anymore. <laughs> yes. Well, that's fascinating. My goodness. Yes, and that's the beauty of Toastmasters. Like the same thing with me. Me was the love at first attendance, as I call it, with my club. But I did visit many clubs. Uh, and they were all great. They all bring value, right? But at the end of the day, oh. that was a good fit. Like, just like you, the moment I showed up there, I was like, oh, yeah, this is it. And I kept shopping around to another cl uh, other club, but I knew already. They just validated, you guys are great, but this club <laughs> is the best for me. We all have different needs, different timing. You know, me, it's perfect Friday at noon. Maybe it doesn't work for everybody else, but we all have a place. That's why it's, we invite people to visit many different clubs worldwide, even if they, they want to. But even better if it's in your neighborhood, but we have so many options. It's like a whole community worldwide. I have told individuals where I said, you may enjoy Toastmasters. This is what you're going to expect. However, remember that the first, or just know, not remember, but know that Amy has told you, the first club may not feel right. Go to another one because you'd be amazed at, well, it's the same process and procedure. There's just a different fit and it's amazing. <laughs> the energy, the chemistry, and just with, we make up, the members make up the clubs, right? So there's just, it just takes one person that you don't connect with to make you not want to show up, right? So change, go somewhere else, yes. Oh, thank you for sharing this. Okay, so since you were a little shy girl and well, most of your life you suffered from that, what would you like to tell someone who's watching us right now who is terrified of public speaking? Okay, whether it's virtually or in person, and they just don't feel like they have the courage to go even do what you did, to go visit the Toastmasters Club. What would you like to tell them? My first advice would be go. However, I recognize the position that that individual must be in that's preventing them from actually going. And I would recommend to them, use the internet. Go to Google. You can surely find videos of a Toastmasters meeting that have been live streamed that are now available after the fact. Um, or even one that might actually be live streaming, but it's not an interactive, they're just simply broadcasting their meeting. Watch a meeting and find out what it's all about. See how the members help each other. See the support, see the style of evaluations you get, you receive, that a, the speaker, sorry, I say you, because it's me in this moment, but that a Toastmaster receives as you're watching that. We learn how to give positive, constructive feedback. We are here to lift our fellow members up in every way possible. We're here to encourage them. We're here to help. Now, if you do have the courage to go to a Toastmasters meeting and participate, 
maybe watching those videos first will also give you the questions to give you that comfort level of knowing what you're going into first and being prepared with some questions to ask. Uh, never be afraid to ask a question, whether it be publicly or whether it be to an individual who is beside you quietly. They're always, all, every Toastmasters club, every Toastmaster that I've ever known is always open to answering questions. So if you have their courage to go ask questions, don't be afraid to speak up. This is your first opportunity. And know that the Toastmasters program is there to support you and is self-paced and built on experiential learning. So we only learn by doing. For sure, there are certainly all kinds of public speaking courses offered and they will give you a binder, teach you everything, but at no point in time do you repeatedly go up to the front of that classroom to actually give a speech or to give an invocation or a certain introduction, a style of speaking that's required in a meeting, facilitating, et cetera. You don't get that practice in those courses. So in Toastmasters, you have the experiential learning as you need it, as you want it, and as you like it, based on the opportunities of the education program. So that experiential learning is exactly why Toastmasters is far exceeding many other programs. And I'm just going to mention the self-paced learning is that often life does happen. It's going to happen. It happens to all of us. And, and sometimes it's dramatic and sometimes it's very quiet, but life happens. That self-paced allows you to work within your comfort zone, but maybe pushing that comfort zone a little, all while maneuvering the everyday components of what life gives us. My recommendation to you is that self-paced can assist you uh, in many ways, and the club members work to that because everyone is on their own self-paced learning. So between the experiential learning and the self-paced program, Toastmasters is genuinely phenomenal. That once you've found a comfort with how the style is, if you've watched videos online, go visit a meeting. And once you visited a meeting and you see and experience how they're how they're actually doing it, then join the club and you will not regret it. Every Toastmaster ever that I have spoken to has always said their biggest regret is they never joined earlier or they didn't join earlier. Biggest regret, hands down. You're right. Every single one of them. And it's like, it's a game changer. It changed my life. It changed your life. <laughs> so definitely. And what would you, so now say somebody that just heard you is fascinated and think, I want to join as an observer at first and then join because this is a great place to be. So now you are dealing with a new Toastmasters member. What do you wish someone would have told you early on uh, to get the most out of this public speaking journey? That's an interesting one. And it's, it's a, because I think I woke up halfway through my journey. And I say halfway, it was a number of years into me being a Toastmaster. I mentioned the club where I'm like, my people, and I was having a bucket load of fun. Like there is no doubt I was having a lot of fun at the club. And I was doing speeches at the time. It was the competent communicator manual that I was working through. I finished the 10 speeches. I was on to advanced manuals. Um, what I wished had been said to me earlier that it actually took my boss to say to me uh, was, Amy, this program is so much more than just giving speeches. If I had realized the advantages I could have had out of Toastmasters beyond the public speaking realm, I would have, I would have, whatever the proper grammar is, I would have dove in right in faster. Uh, so to share the story about my boss is I actually got pulled into a meeting with senior executives on a project where I knew the information, but I was just low on the totem pole in this meeting. So he brings me in and I sat there like the good little project manager I was, you know, the quiet, you don't disrespect, you don't speak up out of turn, and you certainly don't in a hierarchy organization say something that's not been deemed your time to talk about. So I sat there very quietly through the meeting and when we left, he pulled me aside and he said, Amy, if you ever do that to me again, we're going to have bigger words than we're having right now. And I was, I was so horrified because this was an individual that I looked up to in so many ways. And the, the idea that I had upset him to that extent without even realizing what I had done, um, 
was horrifying for me because he, he'd given me so many opportunities. He was such an incredible mentor. And to think I'd betrayed him, <laughs> that was the red flag for me and the realization that the Toastmasters program could really benefit me. All of those things everybody said about being a better communicator, this was the moment that I realized it had to go beyond the club. And so it's one thing to give a prepared speech and to be you know, well-versed and confident in what you're going to say and you've memorized it and you've got all your body gestures down and you're ready for that moment. But it's another thing to speak with confidence on a subject of questions of their choosing and to be willing to speak up on a, a subject, a project, a, a business meeting that maybe they're not going to like what you're going to say, but being able to be confident in its delivery and your knowledge that you know what you know and making it a discussion then. So having that realization, that's where Toastmasters really fit in. And that was the moment where I started to flip the switch on Toastmasters and make that change and, and got more involved in, you know, thinking about table topics, um, thinking about the Toastmasters role and how that could really help me. I will admit just recently with our whole hybrid situation, I was one that put up my hand wanting to go back to work full time. Uh, love my living room, did not need to be next to the fridge all the time anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> I put up my hand and I asked to go back to the office. Sure enough, I'm back there. And we've now had some on-site meetings with the, the entire team, but some of our team is cross country. I am the one who knows how to do hybrid, who knows how to control the mics, who knows how to make sure that we don't blow our, our ears out with feedback. And it's all these skills that we've learned in Toastmasters that have completely expanded beyond. And it's great because I actually get to say to everyone, I only know this because I'm in Toastmasters. And that's the truth. <laughs> oh, yes, it's so true. Uh, I have this, I work for the government as well. And I can assure you my presentations are very entertaining because <laughs> there's a way to deliver in a way that you can keep people engaged, et cetera. So I, I will never again look at presentation, the presenting the same way as I did before Toastmasters, how to chair a meeting, the whole thing. You can throw in humor everywhere. Um, People yes. think they have to be stoic. Oh my gosh, no. <laughs> you can throw humor in. When you know the crowd or understand the crowd, you can make it enjoyable. <laughs> you remember those overcrowded decks, those presentations, PowerPoints, with like like so much text, nobody can read, nobody would listen. Now, you know, I there's a way to just share the essential, have great images, all those things learn from Toastmasters. You know, I never overcrowd. Nobody will read. Nobody will listen. And you, you're going to lose the people. So, so many, I'm telling you, don't get me started with what, <laughs> what I, I can learn from that. <laughs> We'd be here for days. Yes. Between the two of us, we would both like this, yes. this, this, this. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I would like to say something. You said about your that boss, that mentor. I understand how you felt awful that you didn't speak up. Okay, I understand that. I've been in that situation many times. But I still feel, because I was a manager for many years, decades actually and I would have put you on the spot like Amy um, since you are the subject matter expert would you like would you mind sh chiming in please like he could have said he could have made you speak so I still feel like there's some responsibility uh, on his part no as well no let me be clear no he he did and me being the well-versed individual on trying to stay silent and fly low under the radar did what I normally do divert everything <laughs> Okay. Okay. Oh yeah. No, he, he was a, okay. he was an amazing individual that, um, you know, while he's not in Toastmasters, he was the biggest supporter of my Toastmasters career yeah. and, yeah. and everything I was doing there. The mentoring has been incredible. And the mentors that I've had outside of Toastmasters have been incredible about my Toastmasters career and supportive and understanding and just blown away by the growth that I've had between when they knew me six years ago to when they know who I am now. I shouldn't say when they know me now, but who I am now is it's night and day, yeah. sometimes good, sometimes bad. We've had some <laughs> tough conversations, yeah. but it, but it changed. It's, it's just so incredibly powerful what it does to a person in confidence and in improvement and skill development. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes, me too. My boss actually was the one of my first cheerleaders encouraging me to support. Yes, take the time you need for the for your um, to attend the club. And then when I wanted to launch my YouTube journey, she was like, the, on my entire team, they're all like cheering for me. It's really pretty cool. 
that uh, and I have mentors all around the world because as I said Toastmasters is international so I have people who mm -hmm. who help they just want us to do better right so it's a very selfless organization I find where people want to help others just to help them for no other reason than to just help them grow so, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're a very busy lady Amy <laughs> with your full-time job and a very active life I'd like to ask you, what motivated you to start taking on leadership roles with Toastmasters? Because you're just a member at this point. Why did you want to, to be part of that? You know, I start, I hear the question and I'm like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> um, the, I think the reality is, is I was in a moment, I was at a conference and I just kind of looked around and I went, wow, wouldn't it be neat to run a conference? <laughs> not realizing the company I was in, having no idea what their positions were in the organization. About six months later, I was being asked to put in a proposal to be conference chair and to run a district conference. Um, so the, the interest in that is realizing how much experience you can get beyond the club level. And the club is important. It is phenomenally important. They're always going to be your support system, your rock, your, your main go-to set of people. But the experiences at the district are that, that much grander and the friendships multiply, especially when you don't get to see them that often. So it gets very exciting at district events when you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in, in three months, you know, so good. Or sometimes it's a year before you are able to connect with people on the other side of the district. And I understand online has changed that. Yes, but there's still nothing better than seeing somebody right next to you that you can hug. So that was the interest became came when I was in conference chair because I was meeting more people. I was having different experiences. I was really growing. Uh, and I, I don't like the generic word growing, but I was building that self-confidence that I was no longer afraid to speak at work. Two very different subjects, you know, running a conference versus project management work at in the government at the time, but it it the skills were going across. And that's where I was noticing it. And then I won't lie, because of those friendships and those the people I was meeting and, and the enjoyment of being at the district events, I didn't want to leave the environment that I had been brought into. <laughs> and what, what happened was after the year I was conference chair, I was then the program quality director's education and training coordinator. So I took on a few small roles in there, helping with that portfolio. And after that, I ran for division director and I had a blast. I had six area directors, very unique personalities, but so enjoyable. Each one of them brought their own quirkiness to the table. And I do say quirky because we're all quirky. Like I, I remember the night before my first division council going, why are they ever going to think that I have anything to contribute? Because I am like little old Amy. <laughs> you know, yay. But it was, it was just turned out to be such a great year. I found my own rhythm with them. They found their rhythm with me. The clubs were on fire. We were just having a blast everywhere. And it, it felt like that big giant family everybody had told me about in Toastmasters, but I was finally experiencing it. And so from division director, I put in my paperwork and I, to this day, I've always joked, I only ever wanted to be the, the public relations manager. But I ended up putting in paperwork for club growth director and lo and behold was elected in as club growth director and then I was on the run so here I am this is where I've where I've landed in in Toastmasters and not a regret challenges for sure lessons learned for sure definitely learned that perfection is never going to happen and that was hard <laughs> it's really hard <laughs> but it, it's true and so I, I'm reflective because I'm in the district director moment or I pause for a moment there because I'm thinking of events that have just happened, lessons that were just learned this weekend. Uh, I'm thinking of compliments that were received. I'm thinking of tough conversations we've had, but every one of them have built me up to where I am and where we are. And everybody's journey on the trio is different as well. So what I'm learning is different from my trio mates learnings and but that's what keeps you coming back for more is when you're willing to accept and be open to the friendships, the open, the family, 
but you're willing to be open with yourself and say, I might not have been ready for that learning, but I have now learned it and now have to accept it (laughs) and change. (laughs) Um, It's just a phenomenal way to realize you can be and you can improve and you can continue to, to just find yourself and find where you fit in the world. And soar, really. <laughs> There's no limit to what we can accomplish. So absolutely, 100% with you. <laughs> and I've never been a part of another district than the, the, the District 61, but I think it's the best district ever, <laughs> just saying. And although I suspect they all, everybody says that, but I love the energy in there. And uh, I'm not part of the leadership, but I see everything that you guys do and you've been, you've been injecting a lot of life into the district. And I know after all the last few years, I've been a bit of a struggle with the whole pandemic and everything. So it's just lots of action going on that's getting me very excited anyhow. So thank you for that. And uh, how do you reconcile being a senior HR advisor, a district director, a Toastmasters member and everything else that you do? <laughs> like, how do you maintain balance in all of that? And what do you do for fun? Right. I'll begin with the first part about the balance. I genuinely feel we are never the heroes of our own story that we don't get to where we are without either support, mentoring, help, assistance that provides some of that balance, that ability to say, even though I feel guilty, I'm doing this, not that, um, and not being able to give your attention 100% to any one item. The knowing that you have the support is incredible. So at work, I, I do talk about Toastmasters. I've talked about the position I'm in and what my responsibilities are this year. My director actually knew Toastmasters when I took on this new role in the last few months. She actually knew Toastmasters. She used to recommend as an HR uh, as an HR advisor to the employees to go join the, the department's club. So she was aware of it. She's never been into a Toastmasters meeting. So there's, a, there's some background support there that while they don't know the full in-depth of what I'm doing, there is the acknowledgement that Amy does this. And just the, the go, Amy, you know, <laughs> awesome. I'll get them there eventually, but right now I'll take the support. (laughs) And in my, in my home life, I have an incredibly supportive partner that when this whole journey began, we had a very open discussion about what it was going to involve. And between the three different positions, and I'll talk about it because it's been three, three years that any, any individual will generally go on this, this journey for three years. Each year has progressively gotten tougher and tougher in a positive way, but more and more challenges that you're met with and more and more understandings about yourself that you may or may not be ready for. Uh, but as long as you're open to them, they, they come. And it's interesting. So the conversations we had was that he was fully supportive of this journey, knowing full well that he may be doing dishes a few extra nights and he may be cooking a few extra nights. Uh, and normally he cooks, uh, yeah, generally he cooks, he's the better cook, I'm the baker. Mm-hmm. But the, the trade-off is I do all the dishes mm-hmm. and bless him through and through. I have not done dishes since at least the middle of January. So <laughs> I'm very grateful for his support. <laughs> very grateful. Mm-hmm. Uh, he knows I'm grateful. I have mentioned I have not done the dishes since January. And he looked at <laughs> me and goes, I know, I'm aware, we'll get paid back. <laughs> so it's, but, but you have the support which helps you, helps alleviate the guilt because I think the imbalance comes from guilt of not being fully here, not being fully here, knowing you could do so much more. And that's a, probably the last point of the balance aspect is any one of us could do so much more in any position we're doing, but there is only so much time. So sometimes you have to accept that as long as you've given it your best, your all and everything you got, that is okay you're always going to think back and say, and this work, you know, partnerships, uh, volunteer life, you're always going to have that moment. And as long as you can say, I gave it my everything, let that be okay. Let that be the moment. Now for fun, Mm. (laughs) I, I, I promise people I do stuff outside of Toastmasters. (laughs) Uh, Really, Amy? Really? (laughs) (laughs) Promise. It's been a little heavier on Toastmasters the last three years, but, uh, But no, one of the things that I absolutely love doing, and it's been actually a a byproduct of 
the tumor and that whole experience is what I've learned is often individuals have two reactions to traumatic or sorry, one of two reactions to a traumatic situation. They either somewhat shut down in life because they think that something bad is going to happen around the next corner or they go a little bit crazy and they feel that they have to live life, live it all now and do everything in the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I have calmed down. (laughs) I somewhat took the latter position unknowingly and unaware of that's how I was reacting to life. So I was finding all kinds of adventures because I wanted to do really, really cool things, but it felt super, super selfish if I was just doing them for myself. Mm -hmm. So what I've discovered was you can do really cool things for charities. And so I've, through that, I've uh, climbed the stairs of the CN Tower. I've rappelled down the side of a 30-story building. I've climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I've biked around Ottawa and Gatineau, the local region here, all in the name of charity and asking friends, family to donate for my wild and crazy adventures. And I have to say a lot of gratitude to them because they, they show up every time to support me. And they've been there. Uh, When I did Kilimanjaro, my aunt and my uncle had issued a challenge to me. So that's easy as well. When somebody issues you a challenge, like one, you can't back down. Like there's no backing down from a challenge that's issued. (laughs) You know, there's pride involved now. (laughs) And two, it's just, it became fun because I got all kinds of other people involved. Mm -hmm. So the challenge they gave me was they would give me a hundred dollars so long as I brought in $100 from another individual every week up until the time that I climbed. And so only one week did I call up my brother and say, can you put in 50 by like midnight tonight? Because I'm short. (laughs) But past that, I made every week $100 on my part and they donated 100 um, on their part. And then as a part of their overall donation that they gave, Uh, they threw in more. So I had earned 1300 through their challenge, Mm. but they actually put in a $3,000 donation in my name Mm -hmm. to the organization. So it was, it's very heartwarming. I don't, I'm getting choked up right now because it just means so much to me that somebody would, would support me in that way. Um, So it's been a lot of fun doing, doing those adventures. And I look forward to returning to some of those, some of those you know, long bike rides, the long runs, the the finding something wild to hang off of. (laughs) So yeah, I'm very excited. Well, that's beautiful. And doing it and you know, it's something good will come out of it and can save somebody's life or help somebody. I think it's, it makes it that much more exciting as an adventure. Oh, we have our District 61 annual conference at the Chateau Montebello from Friday, April 14th to Sunday the 16th. (laughs) What would you like to tell every single District 61 member who hasn't purchased their ticket and doesn't see why they need to go there in person? Well, my friends, it is the only place to be that weekend. (laughs) It's a question that many Toastmasters, especially the new Toastmasters say, but why? Why would I go? And if I can share my my own personal first experience at a conference, I actually got to a conference because I had won a division humorous speech contest. And so now I was representing the division after winning club, winning area, winning division. I was representing at District 61 conference. Through that speech, which was actually about rappelling off of the side of that building in a Wonder Woman costume, true story, (laughs) I met so many people because... I had unknowingly made a lot of people laugh. I mean, it was a humor speech contest, but I I know that my humor is sometimes a little bit different than others, but it was interesting the number of people that I met because that event happened. And literally I woke up going, this is a conference. Oh my gosh, the people you meet, it's just Mm -hmm. incredible. And it's really hard to get to the specifics of that to explain why a really funny conversation that happened over dinner and a whole bunch of sarcastic responses exchanged became the reason to go to conferences the next year and the year after and the year after that and the year after that. But it genuinely is about 
about the support you get there, about meeting new people, about the genuine friendships you you receive and you are you just enjoy. And like I said, when you get to see them in person, there's a connection that that is stronger than a connection made online. Um, and it's, it just happens so fast and it's usually over a meal and then the next meal you're sitting together and the meal after that. And you'll find that during the council meeting, you're sitting together because <laughs> you're trying to understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's just a lot of fun. It's so much fun. And when you make those friendships, they don't just last for 10 minutes. They will carry you through year after year. So if you want to know why to go to a conference, I will never be able to relay my experience in a way that will make you want to go. But know that there's somebody out there that needs to meet you. And there's somebody that you need to meet out there because it's going to be a lasting friendship and a lasting connection that will at some point in time be incredibly important in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's what I can say conferences did for me. Yes. Now, if you want me to talk about like the non-gushy stuff, there's all the really cool workshops that happen. We bring in keynote speakers. So we have, I love talking about, we have Bob Huey who's coming. He's an accredited speaker. And not many people are aware of the accredited speaker program through Toastmasters, but it is not an easy designation to achieve. So he is a professional speaker. Uh, goes, his career is doing this around the world. Very engaging, phenomenally engaging fellow. We also have Alexander Matt coming and we're excited over that. Maybe it's a personal thought, but a lot of people have expressed this. So he won second place in the world champion of public speaking. And there is no joking about the second place. Like that is a feat and not something to shy away from. But the significance that's even more exciting about that is in a contest that was hybrid for the first time ever, everybody thought and made assumptions that nobody online could even place. He placed second online and I'm getting shivers right now thinking about it because it was an incredible performance on his part and I remember being in the room when he was delivering it and just being blown away watching it on the screen with all my fellow Toastmasters beside me so we have the keynote speakers we have our own contest the district will announce a winner who will go on to compete in the world champion of public speaking at the next level so it, the caliber of speaking just gets higher and higher with every contest level we have. So if you're not interested in the, in the workshops, you're not interested in the keynote speakers, you're not interested in the, the contest, well, my goodness, come for the district council meeting, because that must mean the policy and procedure is your jam. And that's where you <laughs> want to get excited. It's in that district council meeting. Yes. So it, it's a lot of fun learning about the district. And that's a, that's a taste of it, of what happens, the business that's run, what we're responsible for as district leaders and what we are doing with the membership's money and how we're assisting the clubs to support them through their journey of being a Toastmasters club uh, and through the, how we support the members through their clubs. Um, because no matter what, it for those who have not joined Toastmasters, we'll go back to join Toastmasters. For those who have joined Toastmasters, all of us joined at a club and are in a club. And that's our root, our home base, our solid rock. Um, anyways, I digress because I get excited. But all of that to say is conferences really genuinely are an incredible place to be of more supportive Toastmasters, really funny Toastmasters, <laughs> and really engaging Toastmasters that you need to meet because they are special. Yes, absolutely. I got the bug. Like I don't miss conferences while we run into each other in Tennessee. It's just so fascinating to meet all these people, and it's like, hey, like we recognize each other. Hey, like people rec they recognize me somehow. Party, party, and then people like guests on my shows or anybody, and we have discounted rates at the hotel. If you're looking for an affordable way to go on vacation, we're going to be in a <laughs> yes. beautiful site at the Fairmont Chateau, uh, Chateau Montebello. And we always have great places. As Amy mentioned, we have fantastic speakers that come and who come, sorry. Just wonderful experience to just connect with people and have some fun. Get out of your house and meet fascinating people. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it really in uh, Yes, you'll be seeing me in the Bahamas as well, by the way. <laughs> so I'm so excited for the Bahamas. Yes! I'm so excited. <laughs> I've, I've already spoken to, to be 
uh, potential candidates for incoming. And I said, like, I'm committed. I'm there to support you guys. And I'm there to support Toastmasters and meet really cool people. <laughs> I'm even tagging, bringing my daughter along, actually. So she, she, she was with me in Tennessee. We had the time of our life. So definitely. And she That's got to meet. She was actually a participant. She got to see the World Championship. So bring your kids as well. Make it a whole family thing. <laughs> oh, yes. I support that notion. Yes. yes. Bring everyone. <laughs> the more the merrier. This is so much fun. And yeah, it's an eye opener, really. Such impactful messages. It's a great, it's, again, Amy, I told you, don't get me started. <laughs> so, anyway, this is your interview. What is the next step for Amy Campbell, please? I would love to say what the next step for Amy Campbell is. But I don't always know that until it's happened, or I don't know until I'm three steps into that going, oh, that was the next step. Okay. Mm -hmm. As I said, I only ever wanted to be the, the public relations manager of the district. <laughs> um, I, I have joked openly with the potential incoming district director that July 1st to 7th, I am there for him. I am sleeping to the rest of the district. <laughs> mm -hmm. But after that, no, I, I genuinely want to spend a year supporting the trio in any way they will allow me, whether that's behind the scenes, just providing them why we did what we did, uh, some of the best practices we've learned, some of the changes that have happened in events since I've been conference chair right through this run, because there's been a lot of changes, a lot of progression in how we gather information, how we analyze, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just want to share my knowledge. I just want them to take everything that I know and use it so that they can make it better and keep building off of that. And that is that I can say that that would be my immediate dream goal and desire for, for Toastmasters in the next year. Mm -hmm. um, there's all kinds of, you know, the world is your oyster as mm -hmm. Toastmasters has changed me. I'm wondering where I fit into the world and finding this new world in violence and harassment and being able to assist in not in violence and harassment. I like to, <laughs> a lot of people like to joke about that. No, no, no. Uh, but being able to assist individuals who, who feel that they have been harassed in the workplace or who have experienced violence of some kind and helping make that workplace better because our world is changing and has changed drastically and we need to keep improving. So where that career will take me, I, I, I'm excited to find out. I'm excited to show up every day. Um, it's in, yeah, I go back to, I often, well, I have big, hairy, audacious goals. I don't always state them because I don't always know what they are. I just see them step by step by step and then realize it's happened. I've had many offered, many doors open to opportunities throughout my life that have just didn't know they were coming, didn't know I needed them, but walked through them. And everything has just infinitely gotten better in my world. So I'm just going to keep opening those doors as they come. <laughs> yes. Ooh, wonderful. And if someone in the audience would like to know more about you or connect with you, what is the best way, Amy? Ah, the absolute best way to connect with me is to send me a email. So campbell.amy.l at gmail.com or find me on Facebook, oddly enough. Not the biggest fan of Messenger, but I will send you another method to get a hold of me through Messenger. <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite discoverable on Facebook and enjoy Facebook quite a bit, as well as LinkedIn. Again, just search Amy Campbell. Great. Let me share my main takeaways here. <laughs> if you're not a Toastmasters member yet, visit many clubs until you find the best fit. <laughs> Just show up and participate. And if you're even afraid of doing that, try to research a live stream of a meeting so that you know what you'll be getting into when you go visit one. Fight the fear with improvisation. <laughs> I like that a lot, just do it. No one will combust. That was really nice. <laughs> We're never the hero, the hero of our own story. Uh, whatever it is that you need help with, find a support group or network or mentor. You don't need to do this alone. There's plenty of help out there. And be okay with doing your best. You don't need to be perfect. Just do your best and that will be enough. And if you have not booked your spot yet at the district conference, the District 61 conference, find yourself somebody, a roommate, somebody to share a room. They're so cheap. The, the, the whole, it's a beautiful hotel. 
and it's so cheap, find somebody to, to split it with. It is going to be worth it. It will change your life forever. So that being said, any parting words or story you'd like to share with us, Amy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say thank you for the opportunity. When you sent me the email, honestly, the, my insides went, am I an interesting person? <laughs> what on earth am I going to say? Because you do such great work in, in all of these interviews. So thank you for the opportunity to share my story with the world uh, on Patty Pat's journey. If I can leave one thing that has always stuck with me that in my own journey has been helpful. And I actually found the exact words. So I always knew, knew this is how I wanted to be, but the exact words came in a quote that I used in a speech, quote unknown. I don't know who said it, but there's a superhero inside every one of us. Just some days we need to find the, the courage to put on the cape and be the superhero. Mm -hmm. So if I had to say anything to anyone, just have the courage to be a superhero because they're all around us. And there are all the people that we need and, and people need us. So it's, it works both ways, but just have the courage to do it. Yes. Oh, I'm the one who thanks you, Amy, for trusting me. <laughs> I know it puts people in a particular situation, but I, I knew that you had a great story to share and, oh, you have served us <laughs> with, so you're just a wonderful lady, very high energy. And I love your passion for life. And thank you so much for this. And dear friend, Thank you for watching this entire time. And I hope you're feeling as energized as I am after hearing Amy share her message. And I will leave you with this. The power of your voice can change the world. Find it and use it. See you in the next video. Bye.